when we change our relationship with uncomfortable feelings, whether that's stress, anxiety, whatever those sort of uncomfortable feelings are, if we're willing to have them and use them to our advantage and take them with us, then they don't hold us back. Have you seen this most recent study about the impact of SSRIs and the serotonergic uh, system and how it's related to depression? Uh, I think that there's been lots of sort of news headlines going on, but I think it's not unusual for there to be headlines about things like medication. So to be fair, it's not something I've hugely engaged with because I'd sort of rather go to the source of which I haven't been to yet. So, um, yeah, I try in general, I try to sort of steer clear of um, some of the headlines, partly because they can get it really, really wrong. Yes. Um, but I, I assume there's a, a brand new study. It looks like it, yeah. So this is from theconversation.com. Depression is probably not caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. This is the people that have done the study. Uh, the serotonin uh, theory of depression has been one of the most influential and extensively researched biological theories of the origins of depression. Our study shows that this view is not supported by scientific evidence. It also calls into question the basis for the, the use of antidepressants. Most antidepressants now in use are presumed to act on their effect via serotonin. Some also affect the brain uh, via noradrenaline, but experts agree that the evidence for the involvement of noradrenaline in depression is weaker than that for serotonin. Uh, there's a bunch of mechanisms. Basically, things are now up in the air and chemical imbalance is something which appears to be uh, being criticised uh, and uh, looked at with a lot more cynicism. Yeah, and, and I think it's not the first study to um, sort of indicate that. And there's been, you know, there are sort of, you know, books written on it and, and things over the years. But I mean, from someone who's who's not a medic, so I'm a psychologist, so we focus on sort of psychological formulation and looking at how people can manage their mental health through skills work and, and therapy. Actually, you know, I it, it does sort of ring true that, you know, there are some people that might come along with the idea that um, it's something that is wrong with them. And, you know, there's something in my brain that's not right and I need fixing. And and there's other other people that don't necessarily come along with that um, conceptual idea of, of things that are happening to them. Um, and often will work for, you know, whatever idea somebody has about the origins of their distress, uh, we tend to, I tend to work from an individual basis. So whether there is or there not, there isn't, um, uh, you know, an exact sort of biological cause. Actually, I've never come across anybody. Um, once, once you hear somebody's story um, and and everything that they've been through from from the word go, I, I've never been through that whole process of hearing somebody's story without then thinking of course of course you feel this way look at everything you've been through why wouldn't you it would be strange if you weren't suffering the effects of that trauma or you know this relationship or whatever that person had been through so I've always been able to you know from the psychological perspective I've always been able to make sense of people's distress through their life story and what's happened to them and the way that they are um, sort of choosing to cope with it and their different sort of coping mechanisms and and by adjusting some of those we can have you know massive transformations and how people function well let's say for a second that the serotonin theory was correct and that is what happens i'd be very very surprised if the person with even the worst serotonin in the world but was getting up on time and had great relationships and was eating and drinking right and trained and got sufficient sunlight and da 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 da, da that that person's going to be unbelievably resilient. And the same for the person that has the perfect serotonin balance in the brain. If you kill their sleep for two weeks, make them eat terrible food, keep them in a dark space and give them no friends to be around or work that's meaningful to them, I challenge yeah. the happiest person on the planet to not feel depressed after that. Exactly. And and it's sort of strange, this idea that, um, you know, you, the chemical balance in your brain is is the start of everything. Actually, it's also a reflection of what's happening around you and in your life. So, yeah, if you if you change your behavior, you can change your brain chemistry. We, you know, um, well, our medication can be really effective at doing that. There are also lots of other things that we can do that we can take control of that impact our brain chemistry as well. Andrew Huberman came on the show a couple of weeks ago and he's got this quote where he says, you cannot control the mind with the mind. 
And he's just talking about the fact that our brain states are intrinsically linked to the actions that we take, to the way that we do things on a daily basis, and that actually getting out of the mind and into the body is something that's maybe quicker than, I don't know, trying to think our way out of whatever problem it is that we're facing. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly the sort of the skills that tap into um, the physical sensations are often the first that we would teach in therapy, partly because they are quick acting. They are really easy skills to learn and ones that you can then use whenever you need to, uh, like the sort of different breathing techniques. And, you know, Andrew Huberman talks um, really well about this sort of the different ways you can use breathing to kind of calm anxiety and stress and those kind of things, which is really, really helpful. So they're often the first things that would be taught to somebody who came to therapy, for example, I think while you can you can influence the mind through the mind, it's a, a more long term strategy. So it's stuff that takes more practice. You know, you can learn a breathing technique in in 10 minutes uh, and then use that forever. Um, but also y you can learn how to change your relationship with your thought patterns or your past. And that's the stuff that takes longer, um, but also has a, a, an incredible long term effect. What do you think most people get wrong when trying to understand anxiety? Uh, what do they get wrong? Um, uh, possibly the idea that they can influence it, that it's a feeling like any other, and um, that it, when you have that feeling, you don't have to be at the mercy of it. There are lots of things you can do to influence the intensity of it and bring the intensity of that down so that you can function at your best. You know, we can use that threat response, that stress response to our advantage. And, and it helps us to, to stay alert, to perform, to do what we need to do, to survive, all of those things. But we have to sort of understand the system and work with the system rather than against it. So if we try, like any other feeling, if we're trying not to have it and we're trying to squash it or numb it out, then it, that's going to cause more problems than if we allow it to be there and use it to advantage. What about the opposite? Let's say that somebody was feeling anxious and you wanted to prescribe them a way to make that feeling be as intense as possible, to last for as long as possible what what would you get somebody to do that was feeling anxious that could make it worse? Well, that's interesting because there are lots of things that we do that we think make anxiety better, but are actually making it worse. And the, the number one thing I would say there is avoidance. So when we feel anxious, our body is telling us to escape and then avoid that thing, right? Because that's how our brains are set up to to help us survive. And and that works, right? If um if you're in a situation where there is a threat to your survival, it makes sense that you get out of there, get safe, and then don't go back. But in today's society and where there are lots of psychological threats, your brain works the same. So if there's a threat to um uh, maybe uh, sort of abandonment or rejection or um, if you feel that you're going to be humiliated in, in a situation um, you have that same response your brain says this is not safe uh, you get out of here and you don't go back but if you do that with your workplace or social situations then you don't end up building your confidence in the work situation you if you avoid it uh, it gets harder to go back, right? It gets, it builds up that anxiety even more. So when we avoid the thing that we fear, the anxiety gets worse over time. And, and often that's why, you know, in treatments, exposure or graded exposure is part of um, overcoming all sorts of anxiety disorders. I think people presume that exposure therapy is for a fear of snakes or some of like phobias, you know, like real in-your-face mm -hmm. stuff. But the fact that it exists for emotions as well, for situations, that presentation you've got to give in front of the group, that boss that you hate having a conversation around, and I guess, you know, to a more intense period, even just going out of the house, going to shops, stuff like that. I think a lot of the people that listen to this podcast will be high-functioning individuals. There'll be people that are doing really well. But if they look back to whatever five or 10 years ago when they didn't have the tools that they have and they realize just how fragile they were at that point, you go, well, hang on a second. Yeah, this is, there are complete gradients to this and everybody is always playing at the level that they're at now. Yeah, and, and that's where we can really learn from all of these incredible tools that are taught in therapy. They're also helpful for everybody else and, and who may not be in therapy or may not even feel that they need therapy. Actually, if if there's something you want to master and it makes you nervous, 
do it as much as you possibly can. And the only way to build your confidence in something or to reduce your anxiety about something is to do it more and more and more. And, you know, the things that we do every day become our comfort zone. So if, if you're going to um, you know, if, if speaking in public is going to get any easier for you, the only way to do that is do that more often, but we do it in a graded way. So don't expect yourself to go and speak in front of 10,000 people and be okay with that. You build up to it. So you take, um, the, you know, that first sort of layer outside of your comfort zone that feels difficult, feels like a challenge, but is manageable. You do that and you repeat it again and again and again until that feels like nothing really. It's just easy. And then, you know, then your comfort zone expands and there's another thing that feels more of a challenge. So you do that. So you work up and up and up and, and you sort of get closer towards those things that initially feel like a worst case scenario. But when you get closer to it, it doesn't feel so extreme. One of the nice things about making progress, I think, is that you can look back at the things that used to be a challenge to you and barely even remember that they were something that was difficult. You know, you look at them now and it's just, it's absolutely nothing. And yeah, I, I suppose that that exponential growth that you're talking about is precisely because of that, that it starts off with something small and then you gradually take bigger steps. And then after five or 10 years of doing personal development, you look back and you go, I can't even believe that, that I, I don't even think about that thing anymore. Yeah. Given the fact that, thoughts a lot of the time especially anxious thoughts cause us to obsess and mentally do thought loops around them w what's the solution to break the cycle of anxious thoughts well i guess first of all uh, the, the don't do is don't try not to have them you know if which if you're trying not to think about something you're already thinking about it and so uh if we you know thoughts arrive in your mind because your brain is constantly taking in information from your outside world and then offering up to you ideas of how to interpret that. And, and they are ideas, they're theories, they're concepts, they're stories, maybe they're influenced by memory as well, a lot of the time. And so that's where they are one possible perspective. And so the way that we kind of then shift our relationship with those thoughts is to understand that and acknowledge that even as thoughts arrive. So you know, one big sort of sort of biased thought pattern you would have when you're anxious is catastrophizing. So your mind goes to the worst possible case scenario and it plays it out for you in your mind like a horror movie on repeat. And and it, it, that becomes the idea that yeah, this is going to happen because I've thought it now. And we kind of take on that thought as if it's absolute truth and we run it over and over again. And then our anxiety gets worse and worse and worse. But if we acknowledge that thought as a catastrophizing thought, which is a bias, right? It's, it's your your brain offering up the worst case scenario because you're already feeling anxious, then we take some of the power out of it by acknowledging that it's not a given fact. It's not the one true reflection of reality. It's one possible way of looking at this and there are others. So by doing that, you're just stepping back from it and you're allowing yourself the possibility of seeing things from another perspective. But without that, it's, you know, if we just accept every thought that arrives as fact and a true reflection of reality, then it has much more power over how we feel than what we do and how we behave and all of those sorts of things. So um, I think it's about shifting your relationship with thoughts, not trying to stop them from arriving, but allowing them to arrive and then seeing them for what they are, which is one story. Why do you think catastrophizing would be adaptive? Uh, because if you're in a, a, a dangerous situation, you know, if we kind of, you know, go back a, a thousand years and, and, and you're in a dangerous situation, then if you cannot predict what might happen in this situation, then you might miss something and you're out of there, you know, you're gone. So actually it, it is your brain working at its best to keep you, you know, your brain's sort of main function is not to keep you happy and calm, it's to keep you alive. So it's there to tell you, I know what, you know, the worst possible thing that could happen in this situation, I'm going to present it to you. And then our job is to work out, is that likely? Are there other perspectives here? And and then what am I going to do about it? So it's kind of like the, the negativity bias, but projected forward onto events that haven't occurred yet in an attempt to mean, uh, make sure that we are regularly not going to push ourselves towards something that may end up killing us. 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, if I go up uh, onto um, the cliffs by the coast and I'm walking with my children and my child, I'm, I'm already aware by the time we step out of the car and that the cliff's still 50 yards away, but I'm already thinking someone could fall over the edge. And and that is the way I keep my children safe, right? You, you go to the worst case scenario and and that enables you to act in a way that prevents that bad thing from happening. Whereas if you never had the thought in the first place, you might not put the safety um, behaviors in place. But I guess the, the trick there then becomes to uh, to work out which of those sort of thoughts are warranted as a as a you know something that may happen and is likely to happen. Small, or something. small child's near cliff probably worthwhile thinking about exactly right and um but if it's a if it's a different situation um if it's a, a you know i don't know um or oh, i've got, got pain in my leg maybe there's cancer there you know you kind of jump to that worst case scenario whereas the possibility of that is less likely and and so we can never have certainty right it's always ideas that our brain is offering up to us and and we have to be able to tolerate that uncertainty of not really knowing exactly what's going to happen um but balancing our our choice of behavior and safety behavior with how we want to live our lives so if i feel anxious about going to the supermarket and the worst case scenario is you know i'm going to have a, a panic attack in there and feel humiliated and from that i then make the life choice never to return to a supermarket um that's probably going to significantly impact the quality of my life if I'm not able to get food when I need to and those sorts of things so um it's yeah it's always making those sort of judgment calls around when am I going to respond to that feeling and when am I going to um chew, you know make choices based on my values have you looked at the behavioral genetic stuff around depression and its heritability how do you mean so the it seems like the heritability of depression from parent to child is a lot higher than I would have thought, not higher than behavioral geneticists would have thought because they always knew that it was, everything's highly heritable. Um, but I just think about, you know, when it's the person that's terrified of going to the shops, that seems like such an extreme response. And it seems like the sort of thing that would almost be difficult to learn without being primed prior to that, without having a, a predisposition toward that. And it's just one of the things since learning about behavioral genetics with Robert Plowman, who was the kind of the granddaddy of it a couple of years ago, it really has given me a lot more sympathy, I think, for people that have uh, differing mental states. And that includes people that are unbelievably extroverted or confident or whatever, because a lot of the things that we have have just been imbued to us through our genes. But that it doesn't really matter whether you do or don't have it. That's the game that you're playing. Those are the rules and the physics of the system that you're working within. You don't get to change that from the moment that you're born. You don't get to change that. What you do get to change is the top level stuff in terms of the inputs, in terms of the environment, in terms of blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, it just the range of ways that humans can mentally show up doesn't surprise me given the fact that we're so varied when it comes to our genes, our exposures, our environments and all of that. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, as a psychologist, we always see, you know, those sort of genetic vulnerabilities as uh, rather than fate potentials. And, and so, um, you know, you could come into the room and no one has any idea whether you've got a gen genetic vulnerability to your situation or not. So we work the same with everybody. So it's, you know, yes, if you, if you have a genetic vulnerability or you don't, we can still impact on the expression of those genes through everything you do and everything you put into your life and everything you take out of it. And so um, I think sometimes the danger of um, sort of making that the dominant part of a conversation mental health is that people can feel hopeless about it. You know, that I've experienced, you know, bouts of depression throughout my life, therefore, it must be inherited and therefore I'm doomed to have it for the rest of my life. And actually, if that person was to go to therapy and learn some of the arsenal of tools that are available to, to prevent relapse for depression and to uh, manage mood and, and, you know, those things can be transformative. And I've seen that, I've seen people sort of pull them back from situations that you would never believe people could pull themselves back from. And we have no idea whether they had the genetics for that or not. We just did the work and, and made the change. And so I, I think I have to, in my practice, believe that that is possible for everybody. 
I think it's the same as the broken brain serotonin system that it's incredibly mm-hmm. disempowering. That was why I loved yeah. um, uh, Johan Hari's Lost Connections. It was the first mm-hmm. book. I know that there's criticisms of that book and some of the research and stuff, but it was the first book that I'd read that put the lion's share of your mood in your hands. And I just yeah. found that to be, as somebody that was suffering with depression throughout his 20s, I thought it was so great to hear that because it made yeah. me think, okay, like I've got control over this. And yeah, yeah the, the same when people walk through the doors of your practice, you know, they need to, they need to believe that they can walk out of there making changes and they can. I mean, you know, I've had some friends that have been in some pretty dark places and then they've put the work in and they come out the other side and they're unrecognizable. You go, if that guy can do it, if he can turn it around, then I'm, I'm pretty sure anybody can. Yeah. And I think in some ways that's been the, the bulk of my work clinically has been, um, seeing that transformation in people where they arrive in the therapy room believing that um they're getting something wrong about life and that they're not um they're not doing things in the way that everybody else seems to be because they feel terrible and feeling that they have no real control over that and and once they learn that there are things that can really really help um and, you know, some of it's more difficult than others. But actually, there are some sort of pretty simple things you can put into your life and make sure you prioritize that can make a huge difference. And and once people, you know, realize that potential to have some more of the sort of locus of control uh, within themselves and their own choices, um, it, it's just transformative for, for so many people. And, and that's really why I started sort of sharing videos and writing the book and that kind of thing was to just make some of that um, education available to people. How is stress different from anxiety? So um, when, when we come to sort of stress and anxiety, it's really about how we conceptualize those experiences. So we have that that one threat system that we, you know, everyone talks about the fight or flight and, and we talk about that when we, we are often discussing kind of anxiety. Uh, but I, I sort of, I love the, the sort of concept of, uh, let's say, let's say you've got a meeting at work and you've got an hour before then, you really need to go to the post office. So you dash down there, you, you get there and you know, you've got just enough time to, to post that thing and then get, get back to your meeting. But you arrive and there's a huge line, there's a huge queue that you've got to get into in order to, um, you know, post your parcel. And you immediately feel this rush of, uh, you know, your heart's pounding, the sweaty palms, and you're suddenly hyper alert. Am I going to get back in time for my meeting? And, and what you're, what's happening there is your brain is increasing your level of alertness. It's, it's using that stress response to enable you to reprioritize if you need to and think about, do I need to be here or do I need to go back and make sure I get to that meeting in time? So it's really, um, you know, we would conceptualize that sort of situation as stress, I would say. When we talk about it and use the word anxiety, it might be similar physical sensations, you know, the sweaty palms and the heart pounding, but it's generally going to be more associated with uh, a threat. So, you know, maybe you were due to speak at that you know, work meeting in front of a hundred people and you would be absolutely humiliated if you were going to be late. And so, you know, the idea of public humiliation would fill you with what you would probably call anxiety. You know, that it just feels sort of more threat, threat based. Um, and so, you know, I think there's, there's still a lot of sort of work going on about understanding whether those two responses are very different biologically and whether we can find those markers but I think really it's how we conceptualize it and often when we talk about um, stress or anxiety or any other feelings a lot of people ask me how do I know if I'm feeling this or how do I know if I'm feeling that and often the answer is it really doesn't matter if you're feeling something and you give it a word you give it a label that's already helping you to cope with it whether that label matches other people's label for their feelings or not is not so important if you're able to give words to how you feel and label those things um, then you're already helping your brain to sort of process it and understand it and predict um, what that means for you in the future i heard about young kids in primary school being taught mindfulness practices and i think that they were naming them as kind of different characters 
Mr. Blue or Mr. Green or the the nasty pirate or something like this. And you're right. It kind of shows, oh, how stupid the kids are naming their emotions, colors or about pirates. But there's nothing that's inherently any more virtuous about that word than calling it stress or anxiety. That the, the choice of letters that represent the emotion is totally arbitrary. And yeah. the distancing that you get, this is the beautiful thing of noting when it comes to meditation. You notice a sensation arise in consciousness. You note the fact that it has arisen and then it falls away. It's the noting yeah. fact that actually matters. It's not the words that you give it. Yeah, it's, it's just like the sort of thought bias labeling by just giving it a label. What you do is you step back from it. You get a bit of a kind of bird's eye view, which enables you to see it for what it is, which is not who you are. It's a sensation. It's an experience that's sort of washing over you, if you like. And and by doing that, we I mean, um, in the book, I talk about um, the the it feels like such an old movie now but i remember the jim carrey movie the mask and and he kind of it looks the the mask looks like nothing it's just this kind of old wooden mask but when he holds it close to his face it kind of grips him around the back of the head and then it impacts on everything he does everything he says everything he feels and and it's a bit like that with with thoughts and emotions when when they're sort of here and we can't see anything else and we just absorb that as that, you know, that is fact, this is all I'm willing to see and feel, then it impacts on everything. And the idea of kind of giving something a label or stepping back from it and observing it. So observing that it's an experience that's washing past us. It's like, you know, when Jim Carrey kind of takes the mask off and he just holds it at arm's length. It's just a mask then. It's it's no longer got the same power. It's still in his hand. It's not far away from his face, but it's just enough distance to give him that perspective to see the thing for what it is. I think one of the most important things I've learned about reframing stress, uh, and I guess you could call it anxiety as well, is how much of an effective performance enhancer it is as soon as you stop judging yourself or fearing it. Some of the best performances that I've had, whether it be on the podcast, whether it be at work in my previous job, has been geared by the fact that I'm stressed by it, like yeah. unbelievably stressed. But a lot of it, if you can learn to be excited by it, and I actually have now, I've got a couple of big things coming up over the next couple of weeks that I'm going to be borderline terrified to do. But there's a part of me that can't wait for that. And I was never an adrenaline yeah. junkie. I'm not a uh, riding motorbikes and jumping off cliffs and stuff like that. I'm not not one of those people, but one of my friends, Bridget Fettersy, she's a, a female comedian and she has a little mantra that she gives herself before she goes on stage. And she says, I'm not nervous. I'm excited. I'm not nervous. I'm excited. And that reframe for me as well is look, I'm not stressed. I'm excited. I'm not anxious. This means something to me. And all yeah. of those opportunities, you know, it, it doesn't matter how many, cups of coffee or nootropics or special combinations of vitamins I take, I can't replicate the amount of focus and attention that my body's going to give me by it dumping tons and tons and tons of neurotransmitters and hormones into my body. So I should be thanking it. I should be going, look, yeah, it's narrowing my focus, but it's narrowing my focus because this is the thing that I'm focused on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's such a great example. I mean, that's an example of sort of reframing. And and it, again, when we were talking about, um, you know, can we change the mind with the mind and stuff like that? And I think that's an example of when you can, Good point. that, um, you know, you could do all of these sort of, you know, breathing exercises. But if you're main aim is to just get rid of that uncomfortable feeling then you're going to lose you know you can you can bring down the intensity of it but if you're i don't know about to go on live tv you're gonna feel anxious it's all brand new to you and it's an intimidating situation and there is genuine threat that if you don't stay alert and do the job you need to do you could be humiliated or you could be upset about it so you need that stress and i think that's where when we change our relationship with uncomfortable feelings whether that's stress, anxiety, sadness, whatever those sort of uncomfortable feelings are, if we're willing to have them and use them to our advantage and take them with us, um, then they don't hold us back, you know. And and when I talk about the sort of TV example, when I uh, I did that recently, um, I, I felt that stress and I acknowledged that was going to help me do a good job, so I took it with me. I didn't I didn't try to get rid of it. I used the sort of breathing techniques to keep it at a level where I could focus. I noticed the catastrophizing thought, so this could go really wrong. Might fall and then over. I brought myself 
<laughs> yeah, this is going to go terribly wrong. Uh, and then you, you know, you notice it and then that enables you to let it go and refocus on the thing at hand. So, you know, if you're willing to have that feeling, it will take its natural course, which is to rise and then fall again. Do you suffer or have you suffered more with any self-doubt or with dealing with criticism now that you've had all of these extra eyes on you, obviously going on TV and talking and then, I mean, TikTok, I wouldn't like to guess how many millions of people you're reaching every month on there. Is that something that's arisen for you or have you been able to cope with that? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a human thing, isn't it? And I think that's what I say about a lot of these tools is um, they don't, make you invincible they don't ensure that you're going to have a problem-free life and you're never going to be touched by by doubt or grief or stress ever again they are tools to apply to those situations that you will never to be faced because they are part of life and so um yeah i mean throughout this whole, I, i've never had any ambitions to be a public person i i just started sharing the educational aspect of therapy because i thought actually everyone's finding this really helpful let's make it available. Why should people have to pay to come and see people like me to find out basic stuff about how their brain works? And so I wanted to sort of make it available. But yeah, I mean, then, you know, quite a little introvert who's used to working in a room with one person at a time, that was pretty kind of exposing. And, and you know, you sort of, uh, you then are forced to use the tools and practice what you preach. Because, you know, putting yourself, I mean, you probably understand as much as, as I do, you know, putting yourself out there, will um, kind of expose any sort of insecurities or it will it will sort of invite that voice of self that self doubt to creep in um, so yeah I've had to you know use the tools as much as the next person you are spending at least a portion of your time on TikTok making sure that the videos look right that they've gone up correctly you're probably checking comments to see what do people think what are the issues that they're coming up against ideas from the new videos and such forth how are you mediating your relationship with technology, with social media, with the supernormal stimulus mechanisms that it's giving us uh, to ensure yeah. that it doesn't uh, impact your mental health too much? Um, I've had, I think something that's hugely helped me is that I had this clear reason for starting that was just to be helpful and to make some of this really incredible information that's available in therapy available to people who might not have access to therapy so that they could enhance their own mental health and I it's been my mission all the way along to stay close to that so you know each video had to have some thread of value in that front so whether it was very entertaining and engaging or not um, it had to have some level of message there that could be helpful to people and so a seed so um, that's helped a lot because it enabled me to um, not worry too much about how I looked or whether it, you know, I sounded right or, you know, those kind of things that, um, especially as, as a female online, there's a huge pressures to, um, you know, look certain ways and to sound certain ways and, and all of those sorts of things. So it always enabled me to sort of come back to that whenever those sort of pressures creeped in, I was able to come back to, this is the reason I'm here is to be helpful. Um, that kind of thing. So I think that always helps me. Um, I think also that I started this a little bit later in life as well, so that I, I already had a firm sense of who I was or who I am and um, my values in life. So always coming back to what matters most to me. Uh, I'm a parent. So having, you know, uh, children and understanding, I think I always try to shift to uh, when I'm in a difficult scenario, what would I want my children to have the strength to do or believe about themselves in this situation um, because I know that they won't do what I say they'll do what I do so I have to live that if I want them to you know be confident and to face uncertainty or face criticism with with self-belief then I have to sort of live that out for myself as well. One of the things that I've reframed recently around smartphone use was from it being an addiction to it being a compulsion and I think if I actually look at the behavior for most people, including myself, overusing your smartphone is a lot less like an addiction and a lot more like compulsive behavior. You pull your phone out of your pocket without thinking about it. You're already moving your fingers around the screen without even thinking to the place where you know the thing that you want that you need to get. Now, yeah, sure, perhaps the reward mechanism that's pulling that through is dopamine. Uh, mm -hmm. and But 
it it does feel a lot more like a compulsion. And I think that even though this is again arbitrary, like we said earlier on, reframing the terminology that you use from addiction to compulsion has really changed. This only happened over the last couple of months, perhaps, but it's really changed the way that I see my my smartphone use. I think, look, it's just compulsive. You know, it's the same way as if, because I spent so long, I did five years at uni and whatever, 11 years in full-time education before that. If I put a, a pen in my hand, it starts spinning through my fingers. I don't think about it. And I, I unless I think about stopping it, I can't stop it. Yeah, why, it's why habitual. Is, yeah, it's just a compulsion. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, because I, I, I guess because of my clinical work, I would sort of have a slightly different conceptualization of, of a compulsion in the sense that, so within OCD, for example, that, that compu- compulsion is the thing that you feel you have to do because if not, then something bad is going to happen. So it's often based on a kind of threat response. But, you know, I would certainly definitely see that that sort of, um, it could even be the case actually with with a, with a phone that if I don't take my phone with me I mean I have that if, if I even if I go out for a run if I don't take my phone with me what if what if something happens at home and and my husband and the kids need me and you know it could be 20 minutes before I get back and <laughs> you kind of and and but you know it wasn't that long ago that that was just something you did you know people could live without you for half an hour and and get through it but there is that fear of if I haven't got ultimate connection to everybody I know something could happen and I won't know about it there's something about that and then then there's a sense of freedom you know if you go somewhere and you lose all signal and your phone's just you know obsolete then there's a sense of sort of relief and freedom from that isn't there that there is this sort of fear of if I miss something if I miss an email that's really important what's going to happen and if I you know um so maybe there is an element of that um but also there is that habitual thing of um you just pull it out your back pocket 50 times a day and glance at it because you have been doing that for five years or whatever that's why i don't understand people that go on planes and then connect to the wi-fi you have the opportunity now yeah. of being completely liberated from access to the outside world for yeah three to ten hours or something I, that's for me is bliss you load up a bunch yeah. of stuff onto kindle read through some things listen to a podcast make some notes about stuff that that's my favorite time but yeah i think uh it's very strange the fact that we feel we we feel like the world is so interconnected and even safer now than it was 20 years ago and yet we there's this ambient level of anxiety that we need to constantly be contactable and available um there's another concept that I learned actually by a guy called Benjamin Hardy and it's called the gap and the gain and I've been thinking about this a lot as I was going through your book so he talks about the gain being you comparing the place that you're at now to the place that you were at previously and the gap being you comparing where you are now to the person that you want to be and he writes about most people live in the gap rather than the gain and he says it's like running toward the horizon that every time that you take a step toward it, the horizon moves one step further away. And it, it just made me think that I think a lot of the a lot of the messages that we get about self-worth and what success looks like, especially from social media, is inevitably comparing uh, living in the gap. It's living in that difference between where somebody else is. And this was really highlighted when I did my first Thanksgiving here in America uh, in November. And it's a, an entire day that's built around gratitude. And you go around the table individually and you sit there and you say, so what are the things that you're most grateful for? What were your hugest wins this year? Why are you so happy about things at the moment? And um, all of that together just, it really resonated with me. I think that that's something that a lot more people should try and bring into their life, that model. Yeah, and I think uh, it's a lot of what happens in therapy actually is um, is getting a balance of those things. So sometimes someone will have um, just a, a natural sort of habit of doing one or the other, and and what we do is we often notice it. So we'll 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 look at a pattern. Oh, look, you know, you keep going there. What's the impact of that? We'll step back from it, observe it, and then try the opposite and see what the impact of that is. And so we're never trying to completely not do something or only do the other thing actually there's merit in doing all of those at different times with a certain um if if they're constructive you know if if there's a certain goal in mind so it is helpful to look back and say look how far i've come but it's also helpful to look forward and say okay where next 
and it's often with what sort of flavor are you doing that you know are you are you constantly saying i'm not i'm not there yet and i'm not there yet and then therefore you're sacrificing how you feel today and and being present and potentially being happy in the moment um or are you are you saying uh you know that's where i'm aiming for and here's where i've been yes i'm on the right path this is what's next you know without that without um filling it with kind of self-loathing or self-criticism that then holds you back it's always looking i mean i love looking at all of sort of the psychological work with sort of sports psychology in mind and, and professional athletes you know and if you think about i don't know we've just had wimbledon here in in london and if you think about a professional tennis player they will do exactly that with a coach. They will they will look at how far they've come and, and they will look specifically at what has helped them to come that far so far and what they need to hold on to. And then they'll look at where they want to go next, what the hurdles are and how to break those down and what strengths are going to help them to get there. And so it's always just balancing those. But I think the key to having that balance is being aware of what you're doing in the first place. It's all about awareness. It's noticing. So rather than being stuck in your head, it's sort of watching what happens in your head, saying, oh, wow, look, when I'm constantly thinking about that past event, then I'm held back. Or when I'm constantly moving the goalposts for my future, I'm actually, I'm not living in the present and I'm really unhappy. Or, you know, it's it's only by by getting that bird's eye view of everything, including what's happening in our own heads, that we can kind of see a way out. Talking about things from the past that keep coming up, how can people not be too defined by previous mistakes? Um, I think, you know, when it comes to the mind sort of going back and, and that tendency to ruminate, you know, rumination is one of the a big sort of maintaining factors for depression. And, and um, you know, it will sort of predict relapse and those sorts of things. If you have that tendency to go to the past, something you regret specifically or, or you know, a painful experience and then just churn it over and over again. And so that kind of ruminating that happens. Um, I think again, there is that element of awareness. So being able to notice when you're doing that so that you can choose whether to keep engaging in it or whether to step back and do something different. And, you know, sometimes people will will employ a really kind of simple tool where once they've noticed that they're doing that thing, they, they literally kind of say stop and they, they, you know, put the hand up and they say it out loud and then they activate and they do something different. They move on and they focus on something in the present. So that might be, you know, it could be any activity that sort of grounds them in the here and now um, or movement and exercise is great for that, that shifts you into your body as opposed to your mind and those kind of things. So, um, but, but yeah, I mean, rumination is a, about sort of past events is, uh, a, a really big predictor of you know sort of relapse for depression so it's really important to to tackle that given the choice between getting a night's sleep or going to the gym in terms of resetting my mood i would choose going to the gym i think that you i would? i have more bleed from night to morning than i do from pre to post workout in terms yeah. of the way that i am and yeah, yeah i think that it's not for everybody but it for far more people than would realize it like if you go and play a game of tennis badly uh or something even with just a friend that try and focus as you're trying to hit the ball desperately across the court the fact that you've got something in your hand it's tactile the smells the sounds you're moving your sweat like just that i think is such a big element of it and that's what i appreciated about huberman's work that yeah maybe maybe i think that you're probably right on balance that there are elements especially if you look at cbt and how effective that can be for people like that is about reframing you know, i'm not i'm not doing a cbt with my hands um, but that the definitely getting into the body is something that's interesting. Another interesting yeah. thing that I liked that you did was you talked about turning bad days into good days. And this was something that I was doing when I had low mood throughout my twenties, that one of the, the wins that I would put down in my journal was that I had a good bad day. Uh, and it was so funny to see that pop up in your book as well. Yeah. I mean, I, it, there's a whole sort of, you know, section there on, you know, shifting from those bad days. Often there's that misconception that if you're working on something, that every day should be a little bit better than the last. And and often this is a, a sort of classic sort of example of something that will happen in therapy. Someone will start making progress quite quickly and they'll see a bit of change just from the fact that they, they're coming to appointments and they're talking openly and and it feels safe and those kind of things. And then, you know, things will happen because life happens, right? And And you have a bad day or a bad week. 
and then they feel low and and you tell yourself when you're in that place I'm back where I started I'm I'm back at square one I've got to start all over again and and half of the sort of lesson that you learn is you're not back where you started you can't undo the progress that you've made so far part of that journey of of being well is having bad days and then bringing yourself back to baseline and, and back up and and so you know it's not that you work on something and then every day is just neutral and fine it's that that you learn these skills to be able to sort of haul yourself back up when you've had a tough day because you know the things that work and you know the things that will keep you stuck um so it's all about sort of having that awareness of yourself and what works for you so that you can respond to those bad days rather than never having them what about mood pitfalls that people should look out for um i think uh, yes movement is a is a huge one and and actually in the you know when i've worked with people who have severe depression um often in, in sort of acute hospitals and things um one hospital i worked at we had the 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 benefit of having a, a lovely garden and in appointments with people i would would start by walking around the garden with them as we talked because simply getting your body moving starts to shift things and it starts to you know it doesn't take all your problems away it doesn't change your your situation your circumstances but it starts to shift your biology and can bring someone to a level where they're more able then to engage in the more complex psychological stuff that's going to help them longer term so you get this incredible shift from from any form of exercise and i think it's, a, it's such a shame that exercise has been sort of over the years made to seem like it's supposed to be just this ultimate graft where you put yourself through grueling pain in order to look different and be more, you know, aesthetically pleasing to other people because it creates this sort of impression that exercise has to be that way. Exercise can be putting on music and dancing around your kitchen with your family. You know, you can be moving your body in any sort of way and that's going to help. It's going to, to make your it's going to shift your biology. It's going to shift your how you feel, um, all of those sorts of things. So uh, you, I think part of the work that we do is, is helping people to increase their level of movement um, without it feeling like a chore or something that you've got to endure. Because when you're already enduring depression, that's that's enough already. I suppose as well, there's the brutal feedback loop when it comes to mood, that low mood causes people to move less, to do less, to not eat to not contact other people which then creates a cycle of worse mood which is that sort of ever increasing spiral yeah absolutely you get stuck in that cycle of you know low mood gives you the urge to do the things that keep you stuck so it will you know you'll wake up for whatever reason it could be it could be anything that's induced that low mood it could be it could be something huge like grief or it could be something like um you know you're you're dehydrated or your child was up a couple of times in the night and so you haven't really had enough sleep and so you wake up feeling groggy and low and then you have the urge to call in sick or um, you know, not meet your friend later on or skip the gym or do all of those things. And you, so you have the urge to kind of close everything down and avoid doing the things that actually in the long term are going to help you. Um, just being aware of that again, just knowing that increases the chances that in that moment where you get to choose, you could choose the right thing that's going to help you in the long term. You won't always, right? Sometimes you'll still go around that cycle and you'll kind of, you know, suffer the consequences of that mood wise. But sometimes you'll, you'll acknowledge, yes, I know that I have the urge to not answer my phone to my friends and family when I'm low, but I know where that leads. So today I'm going to force myself to do it. And then you get the benefits of it. What have you come to believe about what a meaningful life consists of? So uh, that's a sort of a fairly big uh, section of the book. And, and it's something that's often looked at in acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, I find that a lot of people who come to therapy with a limited idea of what's really going on, they'll say, you know, I, I'm OK, but everything just feels a bit empty. I feel a bit lost. I'm just not really sure where I'm going. There's just no meaning in anything. So, so many times that has happened where 
life has pulled someone away from what's meaningful to them and what matters most to them because that's what happens right you know and and so in therapies like act therapy acceptance and commitment therapy you just help someone to get clarity on what matters to them and what what their values are and that can be quite sort of crudely done you know you can write things down on a piece of paper split your life and put into the different areas you know maybe intimate relationships, family relationships, parenting, career, learning, creativity, faith, all of those different things that fill people's lives. And you just write down words, bullet points, ideas, not what you want to happen to you, but the kind of person you want to be in that area of your life through good times or bad. How do you want to show up? How do you want to show up as a parent, a colleague, a partner, all of those kind of things? So it's not a goal that you achieve and then it's done. It's a path that doesn't really end, but you always try to steer close to it. Um, and when you do when you do this kind of exercise and these kind of values check ins that I put in the book, you you OK, you acknowledge these are the things that are important to me in this area of my life. And how how closely am I living in line with those at the moment? And if if the answer is not very much, so if you rate it as really high in terms of how important it is to you, but in terms of living in line with it, it's pretty low and there's that gap, it just gives you that indication that you can shift direction. And it might be some small decisions that you make about your day to day life that shift that direction so that you feel you're living more in line with the person you want to be and the life that you want to live and the contribution that you want to make. A lot of people, I think, feel like they have control over the the surface level stuff that they do so their maybe habits and the way that they show up on a daily basis but not the larger direction that their life is is moving in what about making large meaningful changes in life is that simply a case of day by day steps or is there is there something else missing from that um well i guess you know you can make huge big life changing decisions um but often often they're broken down into those smaller steps aren't they and 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 actually when you're looking at um life decisions in terms of your mental health we we always that's why that's why people get so frustrated with therapy that it takes a long time right because that's how we work we don't we don't often sustain big grand changes and gestures that that are life transforming overnight we the the changes we can sustain are those smaller ones that that enable us to um, make a make a shift that we can sustain every day, and then once that becomes habitual, then we can keep that going and without too much effort, and then we can shift on to the next change. So we create big change more, most effectively and sustainably with lots of small changes that add up. I certainly see that in myself, the person that I am now versus the person that I was. 10 years ago, five years ago, even three years ago, it's very, very different. And that it, it's so strange how change works that it does creep up on you. You actually don't yeah. realize that it's happened until you one day, some something causes you to reminisce about the way that you would have dealt with something previously or about a memory of a situation that you managed to get yourself into and the way that you responded to it. And you go, I, I, it's really kind of hard for me to recognize that person and that mental state. I always thought it would be cool yeah. if you could um, take snapshots of the mind in the same way that you can take a photograph and then you could go back and visit the old texture of your mind from five years ago or 10 years ago because it would be so stark, the difference, the things that would have captured your attention, the thoughts and the concerns that you would have had about yourself or the world or whatever – and now you're a million miles away from that. But it's hard to go back and remember that because you're not that anymore. And there isn't that photograph for you to go back and, and view. Yeah, and it's it's like a sort of finding in some old journal, isn't it? And then reading about the things that you were worried about, you know, 10 years ago or when you were a kid and you think, oh, God, you know, it's, it seems like such a, a huge period of time between then and now. And, and actually, you know, it's a really useful skill to be able to create future self memories so where you imagine yourself in the future uh in detail and you look back at the choices that you're making now or are about to make and you consider how you would feel about that you know what what choices if you if you're putting yourself into sort of five years from now what choices would you be most proud of and how would you feel about that and what would be the focus of your attention the main focus of your attention 
in the future self and and what you know what would you be like and why and what choices would have held you back and what things would have propelled you forward and and those sorts of things and so that can be really helpful again in focusing on the choices you're making today and making sure that they are benefiting you in the long term as opposed to um responding to how i want to feel today the best uh, thought experiment that I think in terms of working out what would be a good way to spend your time or the things that you should focus on is to think, okay, at the end of this year, what would have had to have happened for me to look back on this year and consider it a success? And that little bit of distancing, little bit of future planning, little bit of sort of reflecting. I, I did that with COVID um, the, during the lockdown. Okay, what would have had to have happened by the end of lockdown for me to look back and consider it a success? And it was so good. It was the by far all of the planning, all of the journaling, all of that stuff was good for the daily practice but in terms of big picture stuff i just thought well okay what what would i have wanted me to do and it's you it's you you know you know you pretty well you know what you would have wanted you to do but it's just that little bit of distance it's that little bit of future planning yeah and, and it's so useful to be able to ask yourself in any difficult moment um what response would i be most proud of in this situation how can you know and and it, it sometimes just gives us that guidepost to to shift our direction and and behave and turn up in the way that we want to, um, as opposed to sort of reacting and feeling out of control. Dr. Julie Smith, ladies and gentlemen, if people want to follow you online and check out the stuff that you do, where should they go? Uh, either Instagram, YouTube, um, Dr. Julie, and uh, yeah, sharing lots of sort of insights from therapy um, that people can use in everyday life. Julie, I appreciate you. Thank you. And you. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.